Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We have a ready reception to what is offered to us. We're taking hold of it to apply it in our life. We will be hearers and doers of it, and it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. This morning we're going to begin to talk to you on the subject of deliverance, a very important subject that everybody must understand, and we're going to be thoroughly covering this subject. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Every single believer is to cast out demons. Notice that. These signs follow them that believe. If you're a believer, he wants you to be casting out demons. Therefore, deliverance is for the body of Christ. We need to be casting the spirits out of ourselves as well as casting them out of others who will be receptive, who are born again, and walking in the ways of the Lord. In Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, this is where Jesus stood up at Nazareth and he said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. This is the ministry of Jesus, and he wants to bring it forth in our lives as well as through us in the lives of others. The anointing was upon him and the anointing is upon us to preach the gospel. And we bring healing, but also he says, preach deliverance to the captives. This particular word deliverance is a Greek word, aphesis, which means to release from bondage or imprisonment. Notice it here in the lower window where we bring up the Strong's numbers and the Greek word or Hebrew word and the meanings. Release from bondage or imprisonment. Deliverance, which is casting out evil spirits, will release you from spiritual bondage and imprisonment that the enemy, the devil, has brought into a person's life. Also, the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. When we put the cursor over the word set at liberty, I want you to notice it's the exact same word, number 859, Ephesus, to release from bondage or imprisonment. Why they changed it and didn't translate it consistently uh, is not really a good thing. They should have translated the same thing. And to bring deliverance to them that are bruised. Deliverance brings you out of captivity, and deliverance will heal and restore you from all the bruises, the damage in the emotions, in the mind, all the things that the enemy has brought forth against a person. We must understand that deliverance was the regular ministry of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 1, verse 39, this is speaking about Jesus. It says he preached in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, and he cast out devils. Everywhere Jesus went, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But he just didn't preach the gospel of the kingdom, and that was it. What did he do? He cast out demons out of the people. That means every place he was going, he was doing it publicly in the synagogues. This word cast out is a Greek word, as you see below, ekbalo. Ekbalo Balo is the main root word, which means to throw, literally. And the word ek is a prefix meaning out, so it means to throw out, cast out, or as it says, to drive out or send out here, but literally it actually means to throw out in the realm of the spirit. We are casting out, throwing out these spirits out of people, and of course we do it through the name of Jesus. This was the regular ministry of Jesus. In fact, Jesus did it all the time. We see in Luke chapter 13, when we come to when Jesus was going to the cross, in verse 32, he made this statement. He says, Go ye and tell that fox, speaking about Herod, they were telling him in the previous verse to get out and depart from Jerusalem because Herod would be after him to kill him. He says, Go and tell him that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. In other words, he was going to do his normal ministry for those two days, until the third day when he was going to go to the cross. That points out the fact that the more normal ministry of Jesus, except for when he was withdrawn in prayer, was to preach the gospel and to cast out demons and heal the sick every day. That's exactly what God wants to be done today. It hasn't changed. Jesus is still doing the work through us as we cast out the demons and bring healing to the people to see them be set free. Now we must understand who our adversary is. You may have problems in your life. 
You may have physical sickness and disease. You may have bondage in your mind. You might have all kinds of problems that are going on in your life. You've got to realize that who's your adversary? It's the devil. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. Who is your adversary? It's the devil. As a roaring lion, doesn't say he is, but as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is the one who is carrying out the destruction. Notice, he's seeking to devour. It means he's very active. He's active trying to devour people and bring destruction in their life. We also see in Revelation chapter 12, speaking about who the devil is in verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. His names, he's called the old serpent, he's called the devil, he's called Satan, that deceives the whole world. The word Satan means adversary. So he is the adversary of mankind. Now we must understand who he was originally and who this person is that it speaks of. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 12, excuse me, 14, 14 verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12, it says this, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning? Thou art cut down, how art thou cut down to the ground, how, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon, also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. This is one who was in heaven, named Lucifer, which means light bearer or light bringer. He was very bright, shining, beautiful creature. This was the one who was the leader of the praised worship in heaven, as you'll see, anointed cherub. So we'll go over to Ezekiel in a moment. But notice it says, How art thou fallen? He was fallen. This word actually means to be overthrown and cast down violently. Overthrown and cast down. He was overthrown and cast down because of his rebellion to God. Notice, he's the one who weakens the nations, as it says. What did he do? It says his five I wills. I will ascend into heaven. He wanted to be like God, take over. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He wanted to be like God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high God. He wanted to be just like him. But instead, what was he really? In Ezekiel chapter 28, it says over here in verse 12, speaks of one, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Speaking to someone that had wisdom and was perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden. Who's that talking about? That's talking about the serpent who came to deceive the woman and the man eventually turning the authority into his hands. Every precious stone was thy covering. All these precious stones that it lists out. That's why he was a perfect in beauty, a beautiful creature. And it says, The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. This person is a created being. A created being. Angels are created beings. As he was an angel. And notice it says, The workmanship of thy tabrets. Tabrets refers to timbrels or tambourine. It speaks of rhythm. And pipes speak of instruments. And what it tells you is that music was in him. Music was in him, and he was the leader of the praise and worship in heaven. Thou art the anointed cherub. Who was this person? He was an angel, high-ranking angel, anointed cherub that covereth. I've set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Again, a created being. He was perfect. God doesn't make things that aren't perfect. Till iniquity was found in thee. That shows you that angels could sin. Angels could originate iniquity and wickedness. They could make wrong choices. And that's exactly what he did. Iniquity was found in thee. By the merchandise of thy, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. He was the one who sinned, first one who sinned. Therefore I'll cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I'll destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. 
Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Pride got a hold of him. Thou was corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, because he was a bright, beautiful creature. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou was defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. Iniquity was found in him and defiled the place where he was by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I'll bring a forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I'll bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they don't know thee among the people shall be astonished thee, thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. He was sinned, he sinned, and he cast out of heaven because iniquity was found in him. And who's this talking about? Lucifer, whose name was changed to Satan after he was kicked out of heaven. Now, we must understand that Satan then was kicked out of heaven, and what, how did he get to be able to operate in the earth? Well, we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, speaking about how God made man. He says in verse 26, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And he blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Replenish is a deceiving word. It is a word which really means simply to fill the earth. Some people have seen this and thought replenish means it would mean to fill again. But it's not saying to fill again. It means to fill the earth. Some people have thought that there was a previous civilization which is very, very questionable in the word of God. Replant or fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the earth, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God made man in his image. He gave him authority over the earth. We see how he did this in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God's breath coming into man caused him to be a living soul. And he planted a garden eastward in Eden, put the man where he'd formed him. And we see in verse 15, he told him something. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He was to keep this, which means to guard it. Why would he need to guard it? Because there was an evil one who would try to come against him, who would try to deceive him. And who was that? The adversary who was Satan, who was kicked out of heaven, who would attempt to come and to try to deceive them. Well, it goes on and says in verse 16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. When God says something, it's going to happen. In chapter 3, Here's where the serpent comes. It was more subtle than the beast of the field. Satan comes through the serpent. And he says unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. He spoke about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the one. She didn't really have that straight. She didn't identify what it was talking about. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall surely shall not surely die. The devil will always confront what God says and try to tell you the opposite. He's a liar. He always will try to confront God's the truth. God does know in the days that you, you, you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, you'll be as God's, knowing good and evil. Otherwise, to try to appeal to her to be as God. Isn't that the same thing that caused him to fall? He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be a God himself. So, he tried to pull the same thing on her that he fell for, and knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, here she started moved by her senses, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, like she was lacking some kind of source of wisdom when God was available for all the wisdom. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. She was deceived, but the man was not. He knew exactly what he was doing. And we know this from over in Second. Corinthians, in chapter 11, and verse 3, where the Bible says, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. He beguiled her, he tricked her, deceived her, so that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Satan 
comes to trick and beguile and deceive people, and he did that to Eve. It's important we realize that the woman was deceived. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, Adam was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression, of course. But man, Adam, the man, knew what he was doing, committed treason against God, and partook of that which was forbidden by God, and therefore transferred the authority that was delegated to him into the hands of Satan. And Satan became the God of this world. We see the fact that, remember what God said, that in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die? He did die that day. How? Not physically, but spiritually. He died spiritually. He was separated from God. And spiritual death, of course, leads to physical death, which happened for him 930 years later. In Genesis chapter 5, 5, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. But the day that he partook, he died spiritually, and he was separated from God at that point in time. Now, the authority that he had was translated and given to Satan in Luke chapter 4. We see here in verse 5. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. This is in the temptation that was coming, that the devil was bringing against Jesus. And in verse 5, it says, The devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power, the word power is exousia, which truly means authority. Young's literal translation has corrected the King James error. All this authority will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. How was it delivered unto him? Because of Adam's sin. Adam's sin transferred the authority into the hands of Satan. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Well, these, these are all true statements. Jesus did not confront him on this or, or object to anything that he said. Of course, here's where the temptation comes in. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Thinking, hey, I've got it and I'll give it to you, just worship me. Of course, Jesus recognized the temptation and he said, Get thee behind thee, Satan. It's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he dealt with the, term, the temptation. We must realize that Satan got the authority. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it speaks of him and calls him the God of this world, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Who's the God of this world? It is Satan. We see another scripture referring to him in Ephesians chapter 2, over in verse 2. Ephesians 2, 2, it says this, Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The word prince is the word archon, which means a ruler. It literally means a ruler of the power. The word power is exousia again, meaning authority, as Young's literal corrects it of the air. He's literally, it says, he's the ruler of the authority of the air. He's in that position of authority and dominion. He says, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. We see another scripture that refers to him over in John chapter 14 and verse 30. When Jesus made this statement about Satan who was going coming to him, he says, hereafter I'll not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Remember, Satan had entered into Judas and was coming to deceive and to try to, of course, take him captive, thinking that he had him, but of course Jesus was giving himself into their hands to go to the cross in order to accomplish the redemption. But the prince is the same word, archon. And he's the prince of this world, or the ruler of this world. Satan is the ruler of the world system. In Matthew chapter 12, we see in verse 26 that Jesus spoke of the fact that he has a kingdom. It says so in Matthew 12, 26. If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? He acknowledges the fact that Satan has a kingdom. He is a ruler. He is ruling over the world system. And what kind of a rule does he have? It is a rule under darkness, for he is under darkness. In Acts chapter 26, and verse 18, says this. 
speaking of the preaching of the gospel, that Paul was sent to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He says, to open their eyes in Acts 26, 18, and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power, authority of Satan unto God. He has authority. And his authority operates under darkness. His kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. You and I must understand, of course, that you and I have been delivered, once we've been born again, from the authority of darkness. Colossians 1.13 says this. He's delivered us from the power, exousia, authority of the darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You must understand there's two kingdoms operating. There's the kingdom of darkness, which is the kingdom of Satan, and there's a kingdom of light, which is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We now are in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We've come out of that kingdom the day that we've got born again, receiving Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. In Luke chapter 22, in verse 53, Luke 22, verse 53, Jesus says, When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power or the authority of darkness. He refers to his authority as the authority of darkness. Now, because of the fall of man, Satan now, who's the ruler of this world, the ruler of the air, we see the fact that he, in the position of authority, and because of Adam's fall, he was under, this, under dominion, he was lorded over by Satan, and he was under his dominion. And now, everybody who is born physically has been under Satan's authority, because remember, Adam died on that day spiritually. Spiritual death took hold of him, and he is separate from God. Well, every single person who's been born since then has been in the same position, separate from God, spiritually dead unto God. John 8, 44, he says, You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. In other words, Jesus was speaking, declaring that these religious people were under Satan, and he was their spiritual father. He was the one who was over them. Well, we all got to understand. That's why, of course, everybody must be born again in order to receive a brand new spirit and come out of authority of darkness and be translated into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, since Satan is the adversary of man and he's in the position of authority, how does he work? There's only one of him. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, we see a revelation here. It talks about how his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. This is talking about when he's cast out. A third part of the stars of heaven, and this is referring to the angels, and did cast them to the earth, showing the fact that there was one-third of the angels that fell with him, that rebelled against him. We know that these are his angels that talks about down here where the dragon fought and his angels, their angels that were with him. One-third of the angels fell. We see this recorded in Jude, verse 6, where it says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but they left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness. They're in chains of darkness unto the judgment of the great day. They're going to be judged. The angels have no means of reconciliation. There's no ultimate reconciliation. as a lying teaching that some people have brought forth. Angels are chained under darkness. They left their habitation. What did they do? They sinned just as Lucifer had sinned. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says this, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, so they sinned as well. One third of them followed the devil. And so now these are under his authority. In fact, we'll go back to that scripture we looked at in Revelation chapter 12. In verse 9, where it says this, that Satan, the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast down on the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That means that the evil spirits that serve him are evil angels. They are the angels that fell. That is important for us to understand. 
Also, in Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, referring to this, because we must understand, you know, what are demons? Demons are evil angels that fell, that rebelled against God. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, He said unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So, we're talking about evil angels. These evil angels are the ones that fell, and they are the demons, or the devils, as the Bible speaks of. We also see another reference back there in Revelation chapter 12. That we just saw, but again, see this, verse 7, where it says, There's war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. It references again to the demons being his angels. Now, there are people that have taught contrary to this. There are people that have taught the fact that evil spirits or demons are disembodied spirits from a pre-Adamic creation or pre-Adamic civilization. There's people, lots of people, that have taught that out there. And other people have taught that the demons are spirits of unnatural offspring of angels and human women prior to the flood in the days of Noah. People have taught this. Where do they come up with this? You just need to understand this. They've come up with it because people have subscribed to what they call the gap theory from Genesis chapter 1, 1 to Genesis chapter 1, 2. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Assuming, that they say, that believing that Satan fell during this time, and that Satan caused the fall of a pre-Adamic creation who were alive at the time of his fall, supposedly, that's what they teach. There's lots of books written on it. Lots of people teach this stuff out there. They believe that this pre-Adamic race of men died and their spirits became the demons whom Satan rules over. That's what they believe. And they call them spirits of disembodied people from past civilization and generation. And they take a scripture to supposedly prove their point. It's over in Acts chapter 23 in verse 8. And they say this, where it says, The Sadducees say there's no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Confess both. There was a great cry, and the scribes that were a Pharisee's part rose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And they say, you've noticed there's an angel and spirit is listed in both of those. They believe that the angel and spirit are distinguishing two different classes of beings. That's the teaching that is out there. They claim that angels, and this is written in many deliverance books, books on deliverance. It's totally off the wall. They, believe, these, they claim angels are a class of being and spirits from another. Spirits are another class of beings. They believe that the spirits are the demons today under Satan's rule, having formerly been the spirits of this pre-Adamic race that fell by submitting to Satan between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, saying that's why there was darkness. And they say also that the demons' desire to get into people proves that demons are disembodied spirits from this pre-Adamic creation who want to return to the human beings where they once resided, which is ridiculous, but that's the kind of logic but people say this stuff. It's in the books on deliverance out there if you have read this kind of stuff. It's absolutely false. Number one, there's no evidence of a pre-Adamic civilization anywhere in the scripture. Number two, man was created in Genesis 1.26. No evidence that he was created prior to that. Number three, reasons why this is all false. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. After verse 2, there's verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Could there be civilization without light? No. Light is the essence that brings forth civilization. God is light. Light came after this, so there wasn't any light before. Couldn't be any civilization without light. Also, they assumed that this pre-Adamic civilization died. All these people died. Well, was there death prior to the time of Adam dying? No. There's no death before that. In fact, we even know from Romans chapter 5, 
And in verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin. Otherwise, where did, how did death come into the world? By one man. Who was that? Adam. Could it have come from somewhere else before? No. The Bible says this is when it came into the world. By one man, Adam. So death did not come into being until Adam's sin, which means there couldn't have been anybody, any civilization between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Now, getting back to that scripture in Acts chapter 23, they have assumed, as we look in verse 8, when it distinguishes an angel and a spirit, it's assuming that it's talking about two different classifications of beings. But that is error. First of all, angels. Let's look at about some scriptures about angels for a moment. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7. And the angels, he saith, who makes his angels spirits. He calls angels spirits. So angels are identified as spirits. We know from verse 14, it even says, speaking of the angels, are they not all ministering spirits? So angels are referred to as spirits themselves. Now, when we talk about demons, demons are referred to as spirits as well. Because when we're talking about spirits, they're assuming it was spirits of people from a disembodied, disembodied from a previous, from previous civilization. But can spirits refer to demons? Yes, they can. In Luke chapter 8, verse 2, certain women, women that had been healed of evil spirits, and the devils went out from them. So the spirits are identified as devils. We see another place in Matthew chapter 8, in verse 16, where it says, When even was come, they brought unto many that were possessed with devils. He cast out spirits. What are they? Devils are referred to as spirits as well. We see one other scripture in Luke chapter 4, in verse 33. And look what it says. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. Again, clearly showing the fact that a devil is also called a spirit. So angels and demons are spirits. Angels of God are spirits, we saw that. And evil angels of the devil, called demons, are also spirits. So the distinction, going back to Acts chapter 23, where it says in verse 8, Neither angel nor spirit is not a distinction of classes of being. Instead, it's a distinction between an angel of God and a spirit which is not of God, which is an evil spirit, which is of the devil. That's the way they were distinguishing them. Because people have missed this, they thought it was talking about two different classifications of being. It is written in the books on deliverance. I've read several of them that are well-known books on deliverance supposedly out there. Another reason, one of the reasons why I wrote my book on deliverance. Not only did a, a book needed to be written that was clearly brought forth everything and didn't leave anything out, but also covered all these errors that are prevalent in these books. And if you haven't read this, you're not aware of this, but it's well documented out there in deliverance books that this kind of stuff is being taught. And it is absolute error. Another teaching that they have is that these Demons were the spirits of unnatural offspring of angels and human women prior to the flood in the days of Noah. Where did they come up with that? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, in verse 2, when it says, by the way, it says, Men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Daughters were born unto them. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The same group of people has said that these sons of God are the evil, they say they're angels, evil angels, fallen angels, and they believe that the fallen angels had sex with the daughters of men and produced these giants that came, the giants that were here in, in the earth at these times. As the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare them children, they became mighty men and were of old, men of renown. So they're saying that, the, they're claiming that these are angels, these spirits, this is another teaching out there, that the sons of God 
are angels, and the daughters of men were women, people. What did they produce? They produced children that were men, human beings, right? Not demons. So they're saying that these were angels. The whole point is they think that these were sons of God were angels. No. Angels do not reproduce, the Bible says. They're, they don't reproduce, it talks about. We're going to be like when we go to heaven, we're going to be like the angels that don't reproduce. They don't marry. They're not given in marriage. Furthermore, there's never been any record of any angels that have had sex with a person. And I've had ministered to lots of people where women have actually had devils have sex with them, even brought them to, to uh, you know, f a functioning in, in sexual ways. That's, they never had any children. They never got it pregnant. There has never been one because angels do not produce this. Again, this is, again, lying teachings out there that you need to understand. They say that the sons of God are angels. Well, there may, there's a place over in Job where it talks about, in Job chapter 38, in verse 7, and this is where they kind of come up with this, speaks of the fact that the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, thinking that that refers to angels, and it may very well be. But there's other scriptures that clearly show that, angel, that sons of God are not angels, but they're people. In Job chapter 1, remember what it talks about here in Job? He had seven sons and three daughters. It says here that they were feasting. Job was offering up the burnt offerings for them. And he was afraid that the sons might have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. These same people that teach this kind of stuff say that the sons of God were the angels and that Satan was an angel came along. Well, that's not so. It's clearly talking about people were the sons. The reason we know this is because what did the Lord say? Satan came among them and he said, Have you considered my servant Job? What was all before him? The sons of God. What's he talking about? Hey, how about this son of God, Job? He's speaking about a man. So the sons of God in this situation are speaking about people. So people get way off base and they come up with these kind of things. And I point this out to you because there's lots of people and ministers out there that teach this kind of stuff. It is absolutely false teaching. It's talking about who are the sons, let's go back to who are the sons of God and the daughters of men. You have to understand that after the fall, there was a, God, a group that followed the way of God even though they weren't born again. They were of the line of Seth that followed the way of the Lord, that did what God wanted. Remember, Abel was righteous. He did the right thing, while Cain was evil and did the wrong thing. The ones who were the sons of God were the ones that followed the way of God. The ones that were the daughters of men followed the way of man that was rejecting God instead of following the way of the Lord. And what happened, of course, it's just like taking an unbeliever and a, and, a, and a believer and putting them together. What do you have? You have a, have a problem. You're not supposed to be putting them together. And remember that the wickedness of man was so great in the earth. The wickedness was so great in the earth, the Bible says, back in Genesis chapter 6, that the, the thoughts of men, the, um, everything was just so evil. The wickedness was so great, every imagination, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you imagine that? Every thought was evil continually. Remember, they just didn't live a short life of 120 years. They were living hundreds of years. Imagine all the demons that were coming in over all the sin. We're not talking about just a little time. We're talking about hundreds of years. And then the inherited generational curses coming down the line that would load up each child full of the demons from hundreds of years and all that. What a mess. So no wonder they were full of all this evil. That's why God shortened the time of mankind to 120 years. But we see the fact that this is not talking about angels. This is talking about those who are the sons of God, who are following God, but they made some mistakes and they started having relations, sexual relations with the daughters of men that led them in the wrong path. So I thought I would share that with you so you're not deceived by the teachings out there. If you haven't heard it, you may hear it one day. So who are the evil spirits? They're fallen angels that rebelled against God. 
Now, these evil spirits that serve him, they're the ones that are carrying out his destructive work. Because remember, there's only one Satan. Now, where are they working? They're working in two realms. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. These are evil spirits that are operating in the heavens, in the heavenlies. They're carrying out his destructive work in the heavenlies. They're ruling and reigning over cities, over nations, over, and areas in the, in the realm of the spirit. And they have to be dealt with through warfare intercession, where we bind, we loose, we cast down, throw down, and root, root out. We come against these spirits, we invade the heavenlies, we go up in, into the area of the heavenlies through prayer, warfare prayers, as we've talked about, to stop their works and to throw them down and to throw them out of their positions of operation. There also is a second area where they're operating, and that is operating in the earth. And these evil spirits, which are also referred to as devils or demons, these evil spirits, they operate in the earth serving Satan. They are called unclean spirits, generally, in the Word of God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh, or means he passes through, dry places, which means waterless places. Dry means waterless, without water. What are we mostly made up of? Water. Waterless places means outside of man, or outside of a, a, a being. They can also be in animals outside of a being, and they're out there looking for someone to get into. Seeking rest. They find rest in a person, and findeth none. He saith, I'll return unto my house. They consider the person their house that they've come out of, from whence they come out. When he's come, he findeth an empty, swept, and garnished. These are evil spirits that seek to get into a person. Notice, they were in the person before they went out, because it says, when he went out of a man, meaning he was in the person. Also, we see the fact that there's different levels of strengths of these evil spirits. Verse 45 says, Then goeth he and taketh to themselves seven other spirits more wicked than himself. There are some spirits that are more wicked than others. And they can come, enter in, and dwell. In the last day, the man will be worse than the first. Even so it shall be also unto the wicked generation. And that's what you see. Especially if you've got some inheritors line of a lot of wicked people, no wonder you've had a lot of things come into you and have caused you a lot of problems because they come in from inherited generational curses. Now these evil spirits, you must understand about them. These are the fallen angels that serve Satan and they're operating in the earth seeking to get into man. In James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Devils tremble. That means they can have great fear. It speaks of extreme fear that they have. They have fear. Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness and is ruled with fear. That's the way he operates. Also, in Mark chapter 1, verse 23, there was in a synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, and this is the demon speaking through him, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Notice, these are personalities. They recognized Jesus, and they can speak. They have all the attributes of personality. We've seen this, of course, as we saw the scripture in Matthew chapter 12 that we just referred to in verse 43. We're speaking of the fact that these are personalities. One clean spirit, when the unclean spirit's gone out of man, he walketh, or passes through, literally, showing he has mobility. He seeks, meaning he has purpose in what he does. He says, he speaks, I will, he has will. He thinks, he has purpose in everything that he does. So these spirits aren't just floating around just doing nothing. They have their real spiritual personalities, evil angels that have fallen called devils that have purpose seeking to bring destruction. And they're trying to get into people. And you can have demons in you, as you'll find out. Not just a few. You can have a whole lot of demons in you. 
In Mark chapter 5, verse 7, we see another place where the demon was saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? High God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. They recognized Jesus. In fact, they were afraid of torment. They don't want to be tormented. They live in fear. And it says there, when speaking about his name, that when Jesus asked him, he said, My name is Legion. Legion was a Roman legion of soldiers, what it's referring to, showing the great number of soldiers. If you notice there, that in the time of Augustus in the bottom there, that there were 6,826 men were a Roman legion. This means a legion of demons would be over 6,000 demons in a person. You can have a tremendous number of demons that are in you. So don't think that, well, I might have a couple. Oh, you can have you can have thousands, you can have hundreds, you can have lots and lots of demons that are in a person. We see another scripture showing you that these are personalities. In Acts chapter 19, verse 15, here's where the evil spirit said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? That tells you something. They know those who are right with God. They knew Jesus, and they knew Paul who was born again and had authority over him. But who are you? Who is he talking to? He's talking about the seven sons of Sceva, who are Jews. Were they born again? No. They were trying to cast out demons by the name of Jesus that Paul was preaching, as we see. They were trying to use the name of Jesus that Paul was speaking about. They did not have relationship to God. Demons know who is born again and who has authority over them and who doesn't important that we understand that. So Satan is our adversary. He works through evil spirits. They're seeking to devour a person. And they seek to get into a person. What did they come to do? John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief, which is the enemy, the Satan, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, Jesus doing the speaking, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. All of the stealing, killing, and destruction, physically, mentally, financially, socially, relationships, any kind of aspect in your life has been a work of the devil. Satan has come to bring that forth. You and I must understand that life is spiritual, and we are dealing with spiritual enemies that are arrayed against us. In fact, you've got to understand, God is a spirit. We see even John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. God's a spirit. We know that man is also a spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 speaks of the fact that you and I are made of three parts, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. You and I are a spirit. We also understand that, of course, evil spirits are spirits, and Satan is a spirit, as we've already seen. And we also must understand that God's Word, which is what we're to walk by, is not just something natural. God's Word is spirit. We see in John 6, 63, he says, It is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Life is spiritual. God's a spirit, Satan's a spirit, angels that serve God are spirits, evil spirits that serve Satan are spirits, you are a spirit, and God's word is spirit. This is why you've got to understand that life is spiritual. Now, how do demons get into a person? They seek to come into a person. They only can come in when the door is open to them. There has to be a spiritual door open to them to let them come in. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, it says, Neither give place to the devil. The word place is a Greek word, topos, which refers to a place of residence, when you study this in the Greek, or an inhabited place, as it does refer to that here. A place of residence or an, an inhabited place. So you give a place of residence for something to come in and reside in you, or for something to come in and inhabit you if you, quote, give place to the devil. And how would you do this? Through sin. The verse before says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What is this talking about? This is talking about the fact that you can have a righteous anger over injustice that is done contrary to God's word and not sin. 
Now, how would we sin if we have an anger against people and we, the Bible tells us to let go of all anger, but we have anger against people instead of what's our righteous anger against what the devil has done through people. Otherwise, we're not going to get an attitude against people. We're not going to sin by having attitudes against people. At the same time, even a righteous anger, if you carry your righteous anger beyond that day, it becomes an area of sin. The Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Otherwise, you cannot carry that righteous anger long, or it's become an area of sin. And of course, what happens if you sin? You give a place of residence to the devil. And what's going to happen? Evil spirits will come in through the open door of sin. Sin is a spiritual thing. It is something that you commit from your soul and or your body and allows evil spirits to come in. What happens also when you sin? You must understand that the spiritual door is down. The door is open for the enemy. In Ecclesiastes 10.8, the second part of this verse says, Whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Who's the old serpent? Satan is. What is a serpent? That's a type of an evil spirit. Serp evil spirits are serpents. If you break the hedge, the serpent is going to be able to enter and bite you or cause destructive effects. What breaks the hedge? Sin is what breaks the hedge in a person's life. Have all of us sinned and come short of the glory of God? Sure we have. But sin is what opens the door and lets the enemy be able to come in. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12, it's very revealing of something. In verse 10, it says this, I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Notice, Satan is active, accusing you and me of our sins. That's what he's accusing us of. He's not certainly not accusing us of our righteous deeds. That doesn't get him anything. But he's accusing us of our sins, which does what? It gives him a right, according to spiritual law, which is God's law, which is the judge, to be able to send his evil spirits into a person because the door is open. You must understand, what is the judge in the earth? In John chapter 12, in verse 48, we clearly see what is the judge of all things. John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. What's going to judge the person? The word. When you obey God's word, you'll be blessed. When you disobey God's word, then we've sinned, and that's how curses can come upon a person. And what is Satan doing? He's accusing us of our sins, which gives him a legal right, according to spiritual law, to send his demons into you, and you can't stop them from coming in if you have sinned and opened the door. They're coming in because they have a right to come in. The only way you can score stop them is by walking in God's ways and being right with God so that you don't open the spiritual door. Well, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 tells us something. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us have sinned, what's that mean? Every one of us have had evil spirits come into us. Having evil spirits in you, by the way, doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's how Satan carries out his destructive work coming into you from the open door of sin. And every one of us have been affected adversely. Remember what the Bible talks about over in Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, will come to pass if you'll hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and do all His commandments which I command you this day. The Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come on you and overtake you if you shall hearken to the voice of the Lord your God. That means when you obey, blessings are coming from God. But what happens when you disobey? When you do not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come on thee and overtake thee. A curse is the opposite of a blessing. It includes sickness, disease, poverty, all kind of calamities, national problems, family problems, relationship problems. Hindrances in, in, in do, being blessed and work of your hands. All kinds of destructive things come. This is because of sin. 
When you sin, a curse will come upon a person. And you must understand that when we sin, at the same time, demons are coming into a person, which tells you that a curse is being enforced by evil spirits that have entrance through sin to come in to carry out their destructive work. Now, another thing about we must discuss here about curses for a moment. A curse has a cause and it has that which enforces a curse. Proverbs 26 verse 2 says this, So the curse causeless shall not come. There is a cause for every curse. That means curses just don't happen. Sickness just doesn't happen. Poverty just doesn't happen. Mental problems just, quote, don't happen. All kinds of calamities just don't happen. There is a cause for them, whether you realize it or not. And that is very important. Two aspects to a curse. One, the cause, which is sin. Two, what enforces it, which are the demons that come in through the open door of sin. Now, we must understand that there's three general ways that these curses come upon us. The first one, and the one that influences you and me and everybody on the face of the earth as a number one influence is inheritance. Lamentations 5, 7. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Our fathers sinned, are not, meaning they've passed on. We've borne their iniquities. That means that's an inherited generational curse because of the sins of our forefathers. We see another scripture over in Numbers, chapter 14, and verse 18. Numbers 14, verse 18, it says this, The Lord is long-suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Notice that. The iniquity of the fathers are visited upon the children to the third and the fourth generation. Inherited generational iniquity curses come down the inheritance line and they affect you from three to four generations back. That means you're affected by the sins of your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and even great-great-grandparents that have brought inherited generational iniquity curses upon you. And evil spirits come in because of the inherited generational curses at the time of conception and they're there from day one. They can manifest early in life, behavioral problems. We've all seen, seen a two or three year old child full of hate and anger and rebellion and stubbornness as ever. How'd they get that way? Because mom and or dad was the same way and they got all these spirits that have come into them driving them to be that way. Other spirits can be dormant for long periods of time. For instance, let's say there's cancer coming down your inheritance line. You can have an inherited curse of cancer and cancer spirits will be in you and they'll be dormant throughout your life until manifesting later as your body's getting weaker and weaker and all of a sudden the spirits of cancer will manifest the cancer. And here you got the spirit of cancer. Cancer can come in from the inheritance line, heart problems can come in from the inheritance line, diabetes. In fact, what does the physician always ask you? He takes your medical history right off the bat, doesn't he? He wants to know what your history is, not only in your own life, but also in your inheritance line. He wants to know whether or not, hey, anybody in your family had all these problems? The physicians do that, the doctors. The people in me mental areas, they'll do the same thing. What happened to the church? Why didn't the church want to realize that we have a spiritual inheritance that's come down the line? Let's let these spirits in. It seems like the world's been smarter in things and figuring out where things have come from than the church, who hasn't realized that we have a spiritual inheritance. Every one of us do. So you've got to realize, God has set before us a choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. He says, I denounce unto you this day that you, or verse uh, 19 I'm in. 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Choose life. But you can choose death. You can choose blessing or you can choose the way of cursing that's going to bring curses upon you, which is because of sin. 
Another thing we need to point out that we said that curses go three and four generations generally. But also there are curses that will even go ten generations. Deuteronomy 23 verse 2 says, A bastard, which is an illegitimate child, a child from illegitimate conception, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation, shall he not enter in the congregation of the Lord. This is a ten-generation curse that will hinder you from entering into the things of God. It hinders a person from being born again. After they're born again, it will hinder them from entering into the things of God. I've seen people that are, with this curse upon them that are born again, that it seems like they're just kind of in and out from the things of God. You know, kind of one minute they're walking with God, the next minute they seem to kind of go off in these other directions because this has been part of what causes this problem, a generational, ten, ten generational curse. It can also hinder you from entering into the ministry that God has for you. So God wants to break this and cast out these spirits. Also, ten generational curses from those who are conceived from the product of incest. Deuteronomy 23, 3. An Ammonite, or Moab, and Ammon and Moab were the product of the incestual union of Lot and his daughters, if you remember. It says, they shall not enter the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter in the congregation of the Lord forever. A ten generational curse because of incestual union. So, inherited generational curses because everybody's sin are going to be the number one negative influence in your life. You have an inherited generational group of spirits that came in you day one, and they have to be dealt with. They're not going to go away. That's why you've had the same problems as your mother and or father. Or if you haven't had them, some of the things physically, they may try to show up later on in life. A second general way that demons come in is through your own sin, which we've already mentioned. But one thing we want to point out in Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 17. Not only from sins that you know you committed, but also any sins you committed, whether you know it or not. See, spiritual law rules. You say, well, I didn't know it was a sin. doesn't matter. The demons are still coming in because Satan's going to accuse you of it regardless of whether you knew it or not. Leviticus 5, 17. If a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist, the word wist means to know. It's an old English word meaning know. Though he knows it not, Yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. In other words, you may not know it, but nonetheless you're still guilty. It means ignorance will not work. You can't plead ignorance. Well, I didn't know the word said that. No, you're still, the Satan knows, and he's going to accuse you of your sins, and the demons are going to come into you. Even in the natural, you can sit there and say, well, you're going along and you're going over the speed limit, and you didn't see the sign. You said, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. I was speeding. Doesn't matter. You should have known. Therefore, you're going to get your ticket. You're not going to get away. Ignorance will not work. It doesn't work in any manner. Here we see the fact that anytime you commit any sin, whether you are known or not, you're going to bear your iniquity, iniquity, as it says. A third way that demons come in is through victimization in life. This is people sinning against you. Perhaps you've been through evil things, abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Evil spirits will come in from being victimized by the sins of others through some kind of trauma, through word curses spoken against you, evil words, through things that went on in the, in, in the home, strife, fighting, rivalry, jealousy, all kinds of negative things, rejection, teasing, these things, lack of love shown. Also. From ungodly music, ungodly TV, ungodly movies, ungodly things that come in through your eyes or through your ears. Those are all gates that will allow these evil spirits to come in. Demons can also come in from people that have put witchcraft curses upon you. Witchcraft curses or hexes or spells. If you don't know how to deal with them and know how to stop them, they can have an effect upon your life. They can also come in from cursed food or cursed drink. They can come in from Jezebel spirits, people the Jezebelic that affect a person. They can come in from abuse of your body through nicotine or drugs or alcohol. They can also come in from blood transfusions because remember, the life of the flesh is in the blood and there can be demons in somebody's blood and you get somebody else's blood. I've cast demons out of people 
that have had blood transfusion, had problems, and we started casting the demons out and broke that because spirits can come in from a blood transfusion because it was in the blood of somebody else. That's why if you ever have to get a blood transfusion, you better be sure that it's, the blood is good. That's why people have had blood transfusions from people that had AIDS got, suddenly got it themselves because they got bad blood. Word curses over you that people have spoken negative, evil things. So we've covered a lot of things that are important today in opening up this. We've seen the fact that every believer is to cast out demons. And when you cast out demons, it's going to bring release from spiritual bondage and imprisonment in your life. Jesus did it regularly, and he wants us to do the same thing. We see that our adversary is Satan, who goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's the one who is an evil spirit, a former angel who was kicked out of heaven because of a sin. His name is now Satan, the adversary. He operates through evil spirits that are the evil angels that sinned and rejected their first estate, sinned against God, were kicked out as well. And they're all under chains, under darkness, and they carry out Satan's destructive work. These are the evil spirits that are his angels. We know the fact that because of the fall of man, Satan is now the spiritual father of mankind. That's why everybody has to be born again. We know Satan is only one of him, but how does he work? He works through all these evil spirits that carry out his destructive work. And where are they working? They're working in the heavenlies, the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And they're also working in the earth, seeking to get into people. They have mobility. They're personalities. They can function. They say things. They speak. They think. They have will. They have purpose. They can move about. They come into a person. They go out of it. can be cast out of a person. And they can try to come back into a person. They seek rest and try to find it in a person. And you can have an unlimited number of demons in you, evidenced by the guy that had the legion. And there's different levels of demonic strength. Some are stronger than others. What do they come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy in some aspect in your life. They hate you, and they want to destroy you. We must also understand that the way the demons come in is by you giving place to the devils through sin. When you sin, you break the hedge of protection, and Satan then can come into you. These evil spirits, of course, work according to spiritual law. They can't just come in unless there's a door opener. That's why Satan is the accuser of the brethren that accuses you before God of your sins, which gives him a legal right, according to spiritual law, the word being the judge, to be able to send his demons in you. And God's not going to stop it, of course, because everything's according to spiritual law. You've made your choice. You can choose blessing, cursing. You can choose life, death. Whatever you choose is what you're going to get. Therefore, because we've all sinned, of course, all of us have had demons come into us. We understand also the fact that when we sin, curses come. There's two aspects to a curse. The cause, which is sin, and the second aspect is what's enforcing the curse, which are the evil spirits that come in. To deal with the curse, we've got to not only deal with the sin, but we also have to deal with the spirits that have come in and cast them out. We've also seen that there's three general ways that these demons come in from inheritance, the number one negative influence in your life. Everybody's affected from three and four generation curses. Some people can have ten generation curses if it was from, from illegitimate conception or a product of ancestral conception. Also from our own sins, which we'll cover when we talk about this this evening. We're going to talk about more specifically about how they come in specifically. And also from being victimized in life in some capacity. So from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization, demons have come into us. So that means we all have a lot of demons to come into us. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's just the way Satan carries out his destructive work. And what does God tell us to do? He says that he's given us authority, and he's told us that we are to cast out the demons in the name of Jesus. And as we learn to cast them out, we're going to get delivered, and we're going to get set free from every bondage in our life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father... I thank you and praise you for the revelation of your word. I understand Satan's my adversary and evil spirits are the fallen angels that serve Satan. They are his angels that carry out his destructive work. I understand how they come in through the open door of sin. Satan accuses us before God of our sins 
and demons will be able to come in because the word is the judge in the earth. I understand they come in from three general ways. From inheritance, my own sins, and victimization. I thank you that you've given me authority over all demons to cast them out. I can break every curse in every area of my life. I understand a curse has two aspects. The cause and what's enforcing it. I will deal with all the causes, which are all the sins, and I will also deal with what enforces it by casting out the demons. Thank you, Lord, that as I cast all the demons out that have come in from inheritance, my own sins, or victimization, I will get delivered. I will be released from all spiritual bondage and imprisonment and bruising and all the destructive works of Satan will be destroyed in my life. I will get delivered and healed and set free. I thank you, Lord, for all you're teaching me. I'm going to act upon your word and I'm going to cast out the demons and I'm going to be set free. In Jesus' name, amen. We've introduced this this morning. Tonight we're going to continue on just reviewing briefly, we're going to talk about the specific ways that the demons have come in from sin, who deliverance is for, and start going through many important points that have to be covered so that you're going to be thoroughly established in this. If you can't be here, get the CDs or the DVDs, and this will be an important series. We're going to leave nothing out, nothing in turn. It will be the most, the most in-depth series that I've ever done on this particular subject, and we're going to understand this fully. And also, you're going to be able to cast out the demons out of every area of your life and be set free from every bondage. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We're going to be hearers and doers of your word and see great victory as we do what you command. In Jesus' name, amen.